Welcome to Inflection Point Podcast, where our mantra is cultivating change from the inside out. Join your hosts, Anita Russell, Mavis Bauman, and Gail Hunter, as we create a brave space for conversations about racism, personal transformation, and accountability. Conversation provides a means to dive deeply into your thoughts, ideas, and beliefs, and examine what emerges in your words, actions, and behaviors. The show is a journey towards anti-racism by cultivating change within yourself first and then out into the world. Learn to engage in racial dialogue using four tools, courage, conversation, relationship, and accountability. Discover how truth, reconciliation, and healing can emerge from honest and deliberate conversations Manifest social change right now on Inflection Point Podcast. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Inflection Point Podcast. I'm your host, Anita Russell, and here's a quick hello from co-host Mavis and Gail, but I will preface it by saying we might be having some technical difficulties and we may not hear from Mavis just yet. So, Gail? Hi, I'm Gail Hunter, and I'm really glad to be here, and welcome to our podcast. And Mavis, can you are we together <laughs> welcome everybody sorry about that last minute glitch new uh, technology yes, Ready to yes, go. Yes. all right all right so together the three of us make up the anti-racism mastermind group and we are your guides on a journey towards anti-racism and we're going to continue a conversation that we started in the previous episode and we've been talking about this thing that I call the Cairo question. And the Cairo question is this, will Cairo have to protest in his lifetime for the birthright to freely and peacefully exist in the skin in which he was born? So if you're new to this conversation, you may be hearing this for the first time. So let me just tell you who Cairo is. He's my grandson and he will be two years old in March. And so a lot of the conversations that we're having right now is around this question of what is the future going to look like for Cairo who walks around every day in brown skin. So we always start our show with a question, right? And so the question for this hour as it relates to the larger Cairo question is how is birthright defined? So we're gonna dig into this topic of birthright and we're gonna explore it from multiple, uh, multiple perspectives, if you will. And we're gonna start off with something that I call the coin analogy. And then we're gonna look at birthright through the lens of humanity and finally through the lens of identity. So let me explain what this coin analogy is and then we'll kind of jump into the conversation. So if you can imagine a coin, any old coin, a nickel, a dime, a penny, whatever. Just imagine a coin. And if you think about those coins, uh, any coin, you can see that there's a head side and there's a tail side. Like we're used to, you know, flip the coin and heads or tails and, and all of that. But the interesting thing is there's actually a third side. And that third side is the edge. So you can take a quarter or a dime or a nickel and you can literally stand it on the edge. And so I use that analogy to kind of demonstrate the dual nature of life in America. Because I think you can agree that when you look at any coin, the head side looks one way and the tail side looks completely different. I've seen coins from other countries. I've never seen a coin where both sides of the coin were exactly the same. And so the point being, from this dual nature of life in America, 
You have people who experience America in one way, and you have other people who experience America in a very different kind of way. And so we're going to have some conversations that are around that because the challenge is stepping on the edge of the coin. And so one of the things that I'm really, really focused on is helping people to kind of enter into these conversations where we look at the issue of racism, but we're looking at it through the lens of somebody like me. We're looking at it through the lens of those lived experiences from somebody like me, through those personal experiences, those hurts and those pains and all of that. That's the lens through which we're looking um, at this. So I live on this side of America. And so what I'm challenging a lot of people to do, Gail and Mavis, I've had this conversation with them and challenged them to stand on the edge of the coin and let's take a look at what life really looks like for Black people living in America. So that's what the challenge is, right? And so it takes courage to stand on the edge of that coin. And it can be very fearful and challenging to stand on the edge of that coin. But these two ladies here who are friends of mine, they've, we've come together in very different, from very different paths and that sort of thing. But these are two people who have mustered up the courage to stand on the edge of the coin and really take a look into the Black experience in America for the purpose of having a better understanding of what that experience looks like for people like me or my soon-to-be two-year-old grandson, Cairo. So Mavis and Gail, I'd like you all to jump in and um, kind of talk to me about how that conversation resonates with you or think about the first time you heard me say this thing about this dual nature of life in America. It's easy to look at it from the side that I've been looking at it from, right? The other side of the coin. Um, but when you actually stand on top of that edge and you look down and I don't know, I mean, it's a very different experience. And, um, and for me, I mean, I feel the pain. I feel the suffering. I can feel the, the horror of what has happened to black people in this country from the onset. Um, and I just feel a grief um, and a knowing that this has to change, has to. It definitely does. So when you say, make that statement, it has to change. What does that really mean for you as a white woman who comes from that other side of the coin, but took that step to stand on the edge. So what does that really mean for you? And then Mavis, I want you to kind of talk about that from the same perspective. Well, it means that, um, I mean, many things, but it, I mean, it means that I have to be willing and I am willing to, to say, yeah, we all are created equal. We all are, and I'm part of the whole and not one of us and myself included is better, less, it's we are all unique in our own uniqueness. And we all are, are come from the same collective energy source that we all call God or whatever name you want to reference it as. So it's time that we step into that space and know that and, and stand and say that and believe and bring that into our own heart space, right? And live that, commit to that. And every moment, every time we walk down the street, every time we have we see somebody that is whatever color their skin is, that it's it's a known. It's just a known. Mm -hmm. Mavis. Well, I've been thinking about this for a while, Anita, since I took your workshop. Mm -hmm. It didn't sink in like it has recently. And um, when I think about the coin analogy, it's one, it's one coin. It's human, we are human. 
And standing on the edge of it is uh, less frightening to me, I think, than not knowing mm -hmm. what Black people are facing. Um, uh, I think I know a little about that, but I want to know more so that, you know, from whatever standpoint, I can have more of an impact. I was also thinking about little Cairo, and I haven't even met him yet, but, you know, if, if I saw him in a place of danger, you know, like he was near a sidewalk about to jump into a street or something, and I saw a car coming, I know I would throw my body in front of that car to stop him, to grab that child. And to me, that's just instinctive human behavior. How can we take this coin and separate it? So as much as we have um, to say, we are not the same. We are so similar. We have different experiences, different hair color, all of that. Just like the three of us in this room, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean we can't understand each other. So that's where I'm at on the coin. Mm. So I want you to dig a little bit uh, deeper because one of the things that you said is this whole idea is that standing on the edge of the coin wasn't necessarily uh, frightful for you, but the idea of not knowing. So can you talk a little bit more about why not knowing is so important to you and why that's a little bit scarier than actually standing and taking a look, if you will? Yeah, I can't bear to have the knowledge that I am part of a problem mm. that I just don't even know exists when I have the power to do something about it. Um, as you know from my work, both you and Gail, <laughs> I believe that, that one little act can change something. And I want to know, I want to be doing those small, small acts. Um, I just lost my train of thought. Say the question again. I said I wasn't frightened, right? Right. You said you weren't, you were more frightened um, oh, not of not, not knowing than standing on the edge of the coin. Yes. Exactly. The, the, the not knowing just feels um, like I'm in a room that's just painted white and it's mm. not very interesting. <laughs> you know, all the people in the world bring us such richness and um, uh, uh, diversity is a little worn out these days, but such interest and fascination. Why would we not want to know about other people, especially if decisions we're making in the voting booth or in the corporation, you know, place of work are harming those people? Mm. Why would we not want to know? Yeah. So let me ask you both of you this question given this whole thing with this coin, one side versus the other side, do you think as a black woman living in America that I know a lot more about your side of the coin than you know about my side of the coin? I'll, I'll go for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in a yes. word, right? <laughs> yes, because I remember something you said. Um, I have to know in order to keep myself safe, oh. I have to know more about you. And that hit me in my core. Hmm. I can get away without knowing all that much. It's not what I want to do, but I would want you and everybody to feel safe. Hmm. So Gail, what do you, yeah, what do you, you say to that? Oh yeah, I agree. I, I would want... <laughs> I definitely believe that you would know much more about me or somebody that's white than what anybody that's white would know about you. And because you have to, you'd have to know to be safe. And I, and we ha we've had that conversation and I understand that. And what's sad is that I would, I would want to know more about you because I'd want to know more about you. And I'd want you to know more about me because you'd want to know just more about me. And, and it has nothing to do with the color of my skin or your skin. And that's, I think that's what's, what I'm hoping that we can get to that place of, of just being curious about each other because of just being and not because of the color of our skin and not because you have to be, feel safe and, and know more about me. Um, 
we can be safe to be and it's everything has just been upside down and twisted all around and it's just it's mind-boggling when I really let myself get deep and really really mm-hmm. see and it's like some of the things that we've we've gone over and looking at this for this podcast today it's just bizarre um it's just it just doesn't make sense mm-hmm. it has nothing to do with truth Oh. Yeah, so this is, uh, go ahead, yeah, we we have to, I'm sorry, Mavis, we do have to take a break, so why don't you okay. start your, we, we may have a little bit of time, so what were you about to say, and then after you say this, we'll go into our break. Yeah, you said, do I know more about you than you know about me as a, as a Black woman? What about other, other Black people? Are all of them in that situation where they must know? how white people work and navigate so that they can keep themselves safe. Is that very common? I would say it's very common. It's definitely okay. very common. <laughs> yes, yes. All right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I believe we're getting ready to go to a break. So um, when we come back, we're gonna dig more into the other side of this conversation, which is about uh birthright we're really really going to dig into this idea of birthright we use some historical documents to kind of begin to flavor that conversation so welcome back to inflection point podcast we're going to continue the conversation a shifting the uh, viewpoint just a little bit, and we're going to talk about birthright. Now, when you think about the issue of birthright, there's a lot of different things that a person might uh, believe about birthright. So we're gonna examine birthright through the lens of humanity and through the lens of identity. And so we're going to use some historical documents to help us out in this conversation. And we're sort of having this conversation based on this premise that there certainly are basic human rights that are basically universal to every single human being that is born into this world, including my grandson, Cairo. Okay, so I'm going to start with some text from the Declaration of Independence. And these are the words of Thomas Jefferson. We all know who Thomas Jefferson is. We all know about uh, the, the, um, the American Revolution and, and the Declaration of Independence and how all of that came to be. But I think what's challenging, again, is kind of this whole coin thing. So on the one side of the Declaration of Independence, we have, you know, these noble people and they came together and they decided that they wanted their independence and they wanted their freedom and that they were willing to go to war for it. And there you have it. But then on the other side of the coin was the underbelly of this institution that kind of propped up this new society, this new world, so-called new world that they were birthing, if you will. But it had this this undertone, this this dark side, if you will. So I'm just gonna start by reading, um, and I'm just gonna read a short segment from the Declaration of Independence. And I'm sure everybody out there who is listening knows this probably by heart. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, with me as a Black person, what actually it doesn't even matter whether I'm Black. As a person living in the 21st century who reads that information, that statement, I hear those words and I say those words apply to me just like they would apply to anybody else. And I think that's the reason why I kind of look at all of this stuff from that standpoint of what are those basic human rights. And so the Declaration of Independence is one example of pretty much explaining what those basic human rights are. We were all created by a creator 
And this kind of goes to some of the things that Gail was talking about earlier. And in that creation, we're equal. All men created equal. We have certain rights that are universal. They apply to me. They apply to the person who lives on this side of the coin, but they also apply to people who live on this side of the coin. But I think that's where kind of the breakdown is because we have a tendency to look at this as if it doesn't apply to everybody. And so I push back on the idea that it doesn't apply to everybody. So why don't we move forward a little bit and uh, Mavis, I think you're gonna give us an example of another way of looking at this idea of basic human rights. Yes, this is from the World Health Organization's Universal Declaration of Human Rights from, I believe, 1947, the preamble. Whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Now, I hadn't read that for many years. When I look at those uh, terms, human family, yes, um, the foundation for freedom, justice, and peace. Yes, yes, we keep trying to find peace, but we don't see each other as fully, fully human and equal. So those are words to hold on to. Okay. Uh, now so can you, can, no, oh. can you do me a favor, Gail? Can you yes. read the next part of that? Because I think the next part of that is very important in terms of what this overall conversation is. And when you think about the institution of slavery, you think about chattel slavery, I think that second part of it really resonates. Do you have that in front of you, the second part? I do not. I do not. It's not in my notes. So if you don't mind, oh, okay. if, you it, if you could read it, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Because it just kind of clicked to me that this okay. is um, right. just as important. So whereas disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts, which have outraged the conscience of mankind and the advent of a world in which human beings shall enjoy freedom of speech and belief and freedom from fear and want has been proclaimed as the highest aspiration of the common people. And I think that really, really speaks, particularly when you think about the barb barbarous acts and you think about how that relates to the institution of slavery you think about it within that context of the conscious of mankind. And so when you think about the institution of slavery, where is the consciousness? Right. Where is the conscience of mankind that one group of people believe, truly believe that right. they have an inalienable right, if you will, to treat another group of people as if they are less? So I, 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 as you were reading, and uh, it just I, that just jumped out at me that it was something that we needed to call out in this conversation. Yes. So Gail? Well, the, you want to do the cornerstone speech because that definitely presents the other side. Yes, please, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Hold on for the other side of this coin. Yeah, I mean, the cornerstone <laughs> speech um, was by Alexander Stevens. And, he was actually the vice president of uh, the Confederate States of America. Um, and he did the speech and I'm gonna read parts of it. Um, and this is what he said. Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea. Its foundations are laid. Its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man. That slavery, subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon the great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. This truth has been slow in the process of its development, like all other truths in the various departments of science. It has been so even amongst us. Many who hear me perhaps can recollect well that this truth was not generally admitted even within their day. The errors of the past generation still cling to many as late as 20 years ago. Those at the North who still cling to these errors with a zeal, a zeal above knowledge 
we justly denominate fan as fanatics. All fanaticism springs from an aberration of the mind, from a defect in reasoning, it is a species of insanity. They're referencing the North. One of the most striking characteristics of insanity in many instances, and they're referencing the people in the North who mm -hmm. were against slavery, right? In many instances, it's forming correct conclusions from fancied or erroneous premises. So with the anti-slavery fanatics. Their conclusions are right if their premises were. They assume that the Negro is equal and hence conclude that he is entitled to equal privileges and rights with the white man. If their premises were correct, their conclusions would be logical and just, but their premises being wrong, their whole argument fails. Hmm. With us, and I, I forward it, with us, all of the white race, however high or low, rich or poor are equal in the eye of the law of the law not so with the negro subordination is his place he by nature or by the curse against canaan is fitted for that condition which he occupies in our system period hmm. horrifying right, right. And, and and just kind of letting that sink in, in. right so for me as a person living in the 21st century, and I hear those words, and those words go against everything that I hold to be self-evident in terms of how I see the world, not just how I see the world, but more importantly, how I see myself. And so when you think about words like that, it's such a way of robbing it's a way of robbing people like Cairo. As Cairo is growing, is he supposed to grow into that definition of who he is supposed to be? Because somebody completely outside of himself or some system outside of himself has deemed him, even as a two-year-old kid, deemed him to be less. Yeah. Before he even gets a chance to talk, to learn, to grow, anything has deemed him less by just the color of his skin. Right. I mean, again, when I hear those words, it doesn't make me, um, like I don't feel pain when I hear those words, when I hear words like that, what I feel is defiance. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like, who are you to tell me what I am capable of doing or achieving in my life? So let's talk about that a little bit from your perspective, the two of you. Have you ever, I, let me put it like this. Have you ever had an experience in your life where someone told you that you were not good enough for a particular thing or you created something and it was something that was really, really good that you felt so great about what it is you created and then somebody came along and just like that, shot it down. In an instant, just shot it down. Mm -hmm. So just tell, talk to me about that. Tell me uh, an experience that you may have had where that was what happened. I want to speak for the first, I feel the defiance as you do when mm -hmm. I hear that. And I feel this rage that just wants, I just want to scream. I mean, how can you be? It's like all what I hear is projection. It's all, it's like the, who are the fanatics? Who are that, right? That's where I want to go. And then after that, I feel this deep chasm of this split, this, this deep pain and sadness of how, how can this exist? And even 2021, how can this exist? Yeah, Let alone, yeah. how could this have ever existed, right? And so that's where I go when I when I experience that when you as when you asked, but um, I mean my my mother and I'll tell you share this with you. But my mother told me that when I was in the high school that I could be a teacher or a librarian, 
And I, there's nothing wrong with being a teacher and there's nothing wrong with being a librarian. But what the message to me was, was that, that those were my caps, right? That was what I could achieve. I couldn't do more. I could do less, but I couldn't do more. And so to me, what I felt was this defiance, right? And, and then I felt this sadness, obviously. And then I felt this, I can do more. I can do whatever yeah. I want. And I did. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I can. Who defines us? Right. That person over there? Even if that's my mother, right? Mm -hmm. And that is the me? whole entire point that I'm making right. is that it's not just even you, Gail, as an individual. And I, but I, I appreciate you sharing that story. But if you could take that story and just multiply it by a whole entire right. group of people, not just within this time period, but, but hundreds for years. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and right. that that idea still prevails today. Yeah. Belief system of young people believing that they are capped at a lower place because yes. they've been told that. Yeah. When they're brilliant people, whatever the color of their skin is, and because their skin color is not white, they're not being supported or encouraged or valued. Mm -hmm. Shown a path well, how to go there. Yes. So, Gail, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see where we are. I'm losing track of where we are. Okay, so we're good. Yeah. Um, I wanted I to read. To add. Can I add to what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'm just going to tell you something anecdotally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I totally identify with the word defiance. I think it it represents much of my life. Um, I remember when I was in college, I was talking about uh, at some social event, my interest in going into international relations. And this young man looked at me and he said, like, how, as a secretary or something? Mm. And said, Do you mean secretary of state? <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Colin Powell, you know? Yes, and, yes, but, yes, there yes, was yes. That woman thing, you can't do yeah. that. You can't go as far as you want to go. Mm -hmm. So um, if you multiply that, like you just described, it would just be so heavy all mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. And that's what it feels. That's what it feels like when, when I hear those kinds of words. But the main thing that I experience is just this attitude of defiance. And it kind of, um, like I can remember uh, when I was in college, when I was really beginning to understand the apartheid, the anti-apartheid movement in South mm -hmm. Africa, I had gotten to be friends with um, a few uh, individuals from South Africa and just kind of getting a sense of what that fight was all about. And, um, and beginning to understand that it's the same fight. As I'm listening and watching people responding, like, oh my gosh, this system of apartheid is just really bad and we need to break it. And it's this worldwide thing and all of that. Yes, but we have the same thing right here in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. We have the same thing right here in the United States. And so at some point, we really have to reckon with the idea that things have to change. They have to change. We cannot continue in this country to have this burden of racism that weighs so heavily on the entire nation. So I'm glad, you know, people are coming together. We're talking about it. We're getting these conversations out there. Um, and, and that sort of thing, um, because we just cannot stay where we are. We cannot stay where we are. So any final comments? Because we're getting we ready to go. Yeah, we're getting ready to go on a uh, go to another break. Yeah. So any final comments on what we just talked about? Um, I just just quickly, I took another um, workshop with uh, a long talk this noon. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kyle Williams talked about the result of the conversations and he said it several times it's working mm -hmm. it's working 
And I just want to hold on to that. Conversations like this are working. Yes. Okay. Yes. And remember, we okay. talked about um, when we were met earlier, we talked about this uh, trickle up kind of thing where right. this groundswell of activity and this groundswell of conversation and this groundswell of meaningful dialogue is tripling up. It, it's funneling up. It's rising up. And over the course of time, my hope, like with a long talk, is that over this 15 years to eradicate racism, that we actually get there. Yeah. And I believe we can. I'm believing for it. I believe we will. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, same here. Mm -hmm. We will get there. And yes. it will be with all the conversations that will take place among many, many people, all of us. I agree. And as the conversation is growing mm -hmm. and as the conversation is multiplying and it's not a conversation, I want to make sure that I'm pointing this out, that this is not just a conversation that Black people are having. The oh. fact that this is a conversation that is across racial lines, it's right. across it economic be. lines that people are having this conversation. So, right. you know, you look at the news, you see what's going on, you see all the infighting, you've got this and that, but then there's something else mm -hmm. that is happening in the background. And yeah. I truly believe that that thing that's happening in the background is going to be what makes the difference in this country. We are definitely at that inflection point right, right now. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Point. Okay, we're back and we're going to uh, just continue the conversation. We've been talking about this thing of birthright. We've been talking about it through the lens of humanity and identity. And Mavis has something that she wants to share that's really very much connected to the last piece that we talked about specifically around the cornerstone, uh, the cornerstone speech and the whole thing with slavery and, the, uh, and, and all of that. So we're gonna have Mavis share some information. Okay, so this is this is kind of cool. My great grandfather kept a diary when he was serving in the Civil War, and I uh, did a little um, researching on him. He came to this country speaking only German, and so they put a lot of German people who had just emigrated in a particular um, group, whatever they call it. So um, he comes from the perspective of there was a lot of anti-German attitudes and coming into that American attitude toward the different, the foreign, the, the new. So I found this part in his diary and um, the, one of the first things that caught my eye was <clears throat> the congregations, the churches were told by professors and preachers that the South was in the right and attempted to prove by the Bible that slavery mm -hmm. was a just institution. However, the people did not know what it was all about. Slavery came into consideration only insofar as the South wanted to make territory, which was still available up, open to the institution of slavery. The South knew well enough that this would never happen, but they believed they had the right, and so they wanted to secede from the North. This was the main cause of the war. My grandpa wrote this in 1861. So uh, a little later, it says, the South claimed this right, the North denied it. So the great question could be decided only by force of arms. The Negro hardly came into consideration. That blew my mind. <laughs> Um, that we were fighting over land, over territory, over slavery, mm -hmm. and the people who suffered from it had no voice, no voice. And that's all he says about slavery in the whole diary after that. He does, want, he does um, describe in detail what the war was like and how they had to dig trenches at night to hide themselves and so on. Terrible suffering. But, um, you know, he says... Uh, this, this, so this great question could be decided only by force of arms. Why? 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 
and so many people were killed, of course, but mm -hmm. obviously here he survived and here I am. So when I think about my birthright, which I've never really delved into myself, I've just been born into the fold by accident of birth. And I've had all the rights that, that we've just read about. Uh, I have not been uh, discriminated against except, you know, for being a woman on occasion. <laughs> and, um, and it's just wrong. It's just wrong. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just loved having that sight, insight from someone in my family from, you know, 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. So yeah. any reactions? Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. And um, again, that whole entire thing, like you're talking about my fate, really. Yeah. yeah. You're talking about my fate and yeah. my future. And I'm speaking from the standpoint of an enslaved individual. Yeah. This war is centered around my fate, my future as a human being. And I have no say. <laughs> I have no say at all. Like, I'm not even a consideration from the standpoint of my own humanity, right? right? Because I've been redefined, like I've been re-identified as someone who is, is less than, someone who does not deserve, someone who, this is just what you get. This is the lot that you have in life. This is what you've been given and yeah. you have no choice because underlying what they're saying is you don't have a choice, but to you simply have, bow yeah. down and accept this position in life, not this position that God has given you because that whole entire argument around, you know, the, this Hamitic curse and, and all of that, it's just a way of using the word of God to justify man's actions which is something that man commonly does. Um, but there's this whole entire misinterpretation of how that, what was even happening in that, in that scripture and all of that. And so, but this whole idea, I don't have a say. Collectively as black people don't have a say in any of this. If that happened to Anita and I today, Oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, we, we, we would have had some self-determination our whole lives. And if all of a sudden that was taken away from us, I mean, we need to think about it, you know, ha happening to us as individuals, mm -hmm. not just to a group. It's like, it's got to hit home, right? Yes, yes. Somebody took my freedoms away. I would just- I think, Imagine if another okay. country came to the United States and invaded this country and took people from this country over to their country yeah and enslaved them that's what happened yeah right they invaded a country which is what we did when we came here there were already people living here and right. then took those people and took those people from africa right I took the people from the united states and took them over to their own country and enslaved them there mm -hmm. and that would be horrific nobody i mean who would not feel that that would be horrific but that's what happened. Right, right. And not only that, but I think one of the things that I've always wrestled with when you're, whenever you're talking about slavery is the brutality. Right. Like, I don't, it, 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 it's just like, to me, knowing some of the things that people experience, to me, I, I look at that and say, this slave master is a monster mm -hmm. that you truly have the capacity within yourself to brutalize other human beings to the extent that was done. And you believe you absolutely have the right to do it just because of the station in life that you decided that you belong in. And then also decided that this is the position that I belong in. Why would anybody not fight that? Why would anybody not resist that? Right? Right. 
It just right. doesn't make sense to me that there's this full-blown expectation that Black people are just going to accept this place in life that we've been, that's right. been forced upon us and that we're just supposed to be accept accepting of that. That just really is mind mind-boggling. Anybody to me. Would, believe, would believe that, that you should, anybody should accept that. Right, uh, right, right, right. So we are quickly running out of time. It feels like every time we start really getting into the conversation yeah. that the time uh, begins to dwindle. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that, 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 I mean, that's a good thing because that means we're kind of really, really digging in and, um, and that sort of thing. So just to kind of sum things up, when I think about this issue of birthright, birthrights are legal, social, and ethical principles of freedom an entitlement that we basically have as human beings. And again, we're at a point right now where all of this is being re-examined. You think about 1690, the 1619 uh, project, you think about people like Ibram Kendi and their um, writing and um, Kyle Williams and all of these conversations and this dialogue and all of this that's happening, but it's happening, it's starting to happen across racial lines. And I think that is something that is very different now than mm -hmm. when you go back, you know, even going back to the civil rights movement, as powerful as the civil rights movement was, I feel like this is a different kind of movement that we're experiencing right now because it's literally people sitting down and having conversations with one another. And there's such incredible value in that. So we are literally almost out of time, but I wanted to kind of give the audience um, a little bit of insight in how they can connect with us and, and, and all that sort of thing. So um, the place to soar, there are two ways that you can get connected uh, to me. I'm the founder and the CEO of the place to soar. Um, you can visit theplacetosoar.com and you can find all kinds of details on the work that I do. Um, besides this uh, podcast, I have a coaching practice and I have some mastermind groups that really kind of dig even deeper into these uh, topics that we're exploring on, on the podcast. So um, I'm going to kind of pass the baton to Mavis and Gail so they can kind of close us out with a little bit of information on what it is they do outside of Inflection Point podcast. Um, Gail, you want to go first because I really want to close with a quote. Okay, so go ahead. Um, yeah. my, I mean, I pretty much my private practice as a psychotherapist and being the president of the board of OMA, um, we have a virtual center for mind, body, and spirit. But my vision, vision originated in the awareness that all people have a right to heal from any trauma and access holistic professional treatment um, and therapy to step into their own journey of healing. Um, through our monthly lecture series, we have child and adolescent programs focused on trauma-sensitive training. We actually have a trauma-sensitive training um, that we offer to educators, agencies, parents, community members, and workshops. Um, Anita uh, did a mastermind workshop for us um, last year on transformation from within. Um, we have a program called You Are Not Alone. It's virtual that is for trauma survivors. Uh, we have a panel discussion and people can talk if they want to or just listen. Um, and so we all believe that we are all created, I have a belief that we are all created equal and that we all have the right to live in our life. Okay, so we, we have to, we, I want to make sure that okay. Mavis have a, a, so, enough time to kind of jump in. So we got like one minute left. <laughs> I'm going to do a quick advertisement. I'm president of Seed a Better Life. Uh, you can check it out. It is an organization to support genocide survivors in Rwanda. But here's the quote I wanted to read you. I'll read it at 2x. <laughs> this is an interview of Ibram X. Kendi. And he was asked, are you hopeful that we can have an anti-racist country? And he said, I don't think we have any reason to be hopeful. But at the same time, I know that in order to bring about an anti-racist movement in America, we have to believe that it is possible. In order to bring about change, we have to believe that change can come. Philosophically, I know that, and that gives me hope. Yes. Yes. Amen. <laughs> yes. Yes. So it's all about putting our faith in a different kind yes. of future for 
Cairo okay. and all the other little babies out there like yeah. him that are going to be growing up in this country. Yes. yes. We really appreciate everybody who's listening. Uh, share the links if you can. Um, we'd love to bring more into this conversation and get your mm -hmm. feedback. Yeah. Yes, yes. So definitely go visit the place to soar.com, omapittsburgh.org, and seedabetterlife.org just to kind of get a fuller picture of the work that we do and why we do it and all that sort of thing. And we'll be back um, at our next, uh, our next showing will be in December. I believe it's December the 1st or the 3rd. <laughs> Is it the first or the third? It's the first Monday, or I'm sorry, the first Wednesday in uh, in the month of December. Uh, we'll be uh, back, and um, yeah. Thank you for listening to Inflection Point Podcast, where our mantra is cultivating change from the inside out. The journey towards anti-racism and social change doesn't stop here. Truth reconciliation and healing come from ongoing, open, honest, and deliberate conversations. Continue to dive in and deconstruct your thoughts, ideas, and beliefs as we band together to manifest social change. Tune in to Inflection Point Podcast every first and third Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern here on TransformationTalkRadio.com for more conversations about how we can cultivate change from the inside out.